By 1945, the Nazis were on the run. The Allies were flying high and about to roll over Germany's flat western borders. But in the deep southern heartland of Hitler's Reich loomed the threat of the unknown. Fears grew of a last-ditch Nazi fight back in the Alps. In terms of a defense, uh, it was an ideal place to defend yourself. This one this was high mountains, very difficult terrain. How could you wage a war with tanks there? Almost not possible. Very low experience from the Allied side um, to wage a war uh, in this mountain region. A lot of experience from the German side, so a lot of elite troops there. They knew there were a lot of SS troops in Austria, so uncertainty. Amid such uncertainty came evidence of the Western Allies' worst fears. Neutral Switzerland bordered part of the German Alpine region. The American intelligence chief in Bern, Alan Dulles, had a grim report. It suggested that a fanatical elite was massing in the mountains. A hard core led by those with death heads on their caps the merciless SS would spearhead a desperate guerrilla war from an alpine fortress. It was the very fact that the Bavarian and Austrian mountains seemed to lend themselves so well to guerrilla warfare that this horrible idea, because it represented a nightmare for allied military strategists, that this horrible idea started to gain currency. The horrible idea was an ultimate nightmare for the advancing allies. An Alpenfestung, or Alpine fortress, extending into northern Austria. Defended by thousands of troops, stealing themselves for a final do or die fight for the fatherland. Their fingers on the triggers of an arsenal of secret weapons hidden in crags and crannies. At this time, in, say, in January 1945, they didn't know what was going on when they entered Germany. And they were taken by surprise by the Battle of Balch, was a German counterattack in December 1944. And they didn't expect that. So the question was, yes, we have won the war. This is clear. But, I mean, are we able to cross the Rhine? Are there some secret weapons still? Is there somehow a secret counterattack prepared? So, so it was all uncertain. Uncertainty and fears of so-called wonder weapons were understandable. The Germans had already developed ballistic missiles and jet planes. And other, more fearsome, more destructive horrors were on Nazi drawing boards. What the Allies decided to do was to be prudent, to assume, given Hitler's nature, given the fanaticism of the SS and the fact the SS probably controlled the German state by then to prepare for the worst. The Alpine Redoubt was the worst. It was the worst case scenario that anyone could imagine. And they felt they had to prepare for it. Some tunnels and bunkers had already been excavated in existing salt mines. Even today, the crumbling remains of the would-be Alpine fortress are well hidden. One tunnel complex near the Austrian city of Salzburg was to be the command center of the Nazi Alpine fortress. Such tunnels were also used to build planes and rockets as Allied bombing reduced conventional German factories to rubble. This is where, according to the plans for the Alpine Fortress, the high command of the SS would have been situated, led by Himmler. Himmler's documents in Berlin were already packaged and addressed. The complex extends over 6,000 square meters, and the plan was for 22,000 square meters. As well as bunkers below, the Germans seemed to be amassing manpower above. Senior Nazis gathered in the Alps. SS chief Heinrich Himmler's deputy 
Ernst Kaltenbrunner moved back to his native Austria to a villa above the spa town of Altausee. Himmler named him commander-in-chief of all forces in southern Europe. He would coordinate the Nazi fight back from a region he knew well. He was somehow uh, in charge of the um, secret police and the political police, so he was quite a very important figure uh, in the SS world. Another influential Austrian SS man was lurking in the Alps. The presence of SS commando leader, Lieutenant Colonel Otto Skorzeny, was yet more evidence of an Alpine fortress. Otto Skorzeny was, was Austrian and, uh, by birth and was, was a weird figure with almost no military training, and, but he was very clever uh, to establish himself in the SS world. At this time of the war, in, in April 1945, he was in command of the what we call the Special Forces, the SS Special Forces Command Units. And he was able to withdraw two of his um, command units from the Eastern Front to Austria. And this um, should have been to the core of the defense force of the Alpine Fortress. The region bordering southern Bavaria and Austria was already riddled with old mining tunnels. Some of them were extended and used to build weapons. Schwarz is the site of old Austrian silver mines near the German border. One shaft runs deep into the mountain and a haunting Nazi ruin. The dank, dark subterranean world is usually off limits to visitors. Two kilometers inside the mountain, a broken steel and concrete shell of an underground aircraft factory is slowly rotting away. Bits of rusting metal lie scattered across the stony floors. The corroded remains of aircraft parts abandoned before workers had the chance to put them together. The whole complex is in entirely the same state as it was when it was left, following the detonation at the time. And the workers had only just left the complex. Everything is still standing on mounting racks. It really is unbelievable. Deep underground, far from the threat of Allied aerial bombing, the old mining tunnels were ideal places to build weapons, including a new generation of planes die-hard Nazis hoped would repel the Allies rampaging into the Reich. These are the remains of one of the first jet fighters in the world, the Messerschmitt 262. Almost one and a half thousand were built but only a few hundred flew in combat. The Germans had also developed a jet-powered bomber. Hermann Goering, the head of the Luftwaffe, had uh, dictated a, a requirement to the aircraft industry that he wanted this 1,000-kilometer aircraft, 1,000-kilometer range that could fly at 1,000 kilometers an hour and carry 1,000 kilograms of bombs. And at the time, it was a huge, a very, very uh, challenging requirement for any, any manufacturer to meet. German engineers overcame another great challenge and had developed the world's first long-range ballistic missile, the V-2. SS chief Heinrich Himmler was one of many top Nazis who had visited the V-2 testing facility at Peenemünde. More than a thousand V-2s were fired at Britain. They were the pinnacle of rocket technology at the time, flying some 80 kilometers above the Earth. V-2s sparked fear and devastation. They are estimated to have killed almost 3,000 people. 
launched from mobile ramps, V2s were another potential threat from an Alpine fortress. And there was another, even greater horror emerging from Nazi drawing boards. A longer range version of the V2, dubbed the America rocket. Such horrors were the brainchild of Nazi engineers like Werner von Braun. With Allied invaders closing in around them, in early 1945, they were redirected south to the so-called Alpine Fortress. Von Braun was ordered to go to the Alps, so we received an official order to leave Pienemunde. So we didn't flee, but it was requested that we go to the Alpine Fortress in the south of Germany. The original plan was, which we had never believed, to continue building V2s down there. The Nazi Germans may have had a technological advantage, but they were vastly outnumbered by conventional planes, tanks, and troops. German airfields and factories were overrun. In central Germany, the advancing allies found the remains of another wonder weapon, a menacing bat-like jet fighter bomber partially made of wood. Looked sexy and looked uh, efficient and fast and, um, and you know, uh, uh, menacing. It was a unique configuration and a unique shape. Advanced technology, jet-powered interceptor, faster than anything uh, the Allies could feel. The Horton H9 was also covered in carbon and plywood, making it more difficult to detect by radar. It was perhaps the world's first stealth-type aircraft. The Horton brothers hoped their plane would eventually carry a one-ton bomb. If the Horton 9 could have been put into production, perhaps even fitted it with rockets, which uh, rockets, uh, unguided rockets that they could use to get, uh, have used against the bombers, uh, I think all these things are quite possible. And, uh, fielded in significant numbers. Uh, it would have been certainly faster than the Allied piston-driven airplanes, and it could have had a significant impact on, uh, on the air war. Conventional planes were still winning the war for the Allies, but the possibility of a German counter-strike from the Alps forced a change in tactics. Potential threats like Hitler's rocket engineers had to be stopped from reaching the mountains in the south. General Eisenhower, because of his fear of um, a final Nazi campaign in the mountains of southern Bavaria and Austria, decides to cut Germany in half to prevent troops, Wehrmacht and SS troops from the northern part of Germany to go south to Bavaria and Austria. Eisenhower changed the direction of his main thrust and directed a spearhead south towards the Alps. He doesn't want to see them filling the mountains with material, ammunition, war troops. So Allied strategy is directly affected. How long would it take to defeat 300,000 Nazis armed to the teeth in the mountains? No one knew. The rocket engineers from the Baltic coast evaded the Allied advance and made it to the Alps. They were a vital asset to be protected in the barracks of the Gebirgsjäger, or mountain troops. Originally, the SS had planned that we all moved into the barracks. They wanted to concentrate us all there. But then one bomb could have killed the entire team. So this convinced the SS commander that we should disperse across the country. Rocket engineers were not the only assets moved to the relative safety of the Alps. The Reichsbank in Berlin was badly bombed. Gold, cash and other reserves were no longer safe in the capital. 
hundreds of millions of dollars worth of government and private treasure was shipped south. I believe that this is the only time in history that so much treasure has been consolidated together. A treasure of such uh, incalculable value has been concentrated in one area at one time. Most of the Reichsbank gold dumped in a mine was recovered by the Allies. A small percentage remained unaccounted for. There are still Nazi relics in the tunnels, mines, and Alpine lakes around Germany's southern borders. Some believe that fabled Nazi treasure still lies hidden in the region where Hitler's die-hard disciples planned to raise an Alpine fortress. Some tantalizing tales of Nazi treasure are based on supposed eyewitness accounts in the last days of the war. But not all can be dismissed as fanciful. A mule train spotted traveling up an alpine mountain one night attracted attention. So some locals, who had relatively little to do with the confusion of the war, realized something was going on, including my mother. She was a young girl then, and after doing the chores in the stables one evening, she saw a column of mules making its way up the mountain path. One special thing she always mentioned was that there was a white mule among them. Eva Sturm's mother saw what was supposed to be a secret transport of hundreds of gold bars worth millions of dollars. It didn't stay a secret for long. This gold was also eventually recovered by American troops after rumors spread about the mysterious mule train in the night. I think the rumors started because there were a few forest workers who saw these bags. So it wasn't all that secret. Many people had noticed something. Rumors and stories persist of other buried treasures that were not recovered. According to local legends, some people grew suddenly rich after the war. Such tales have attracted a new generation of treasure hunters in the old Alpine Fortress territory. Oh, yeah. Oh, there's something here. We're at the end of our expertise here. We need someone to help us. A bomb disposal team confirmed that they were right to be cautious. Jürgen and fellow treasure hunters found a cache of live rifle grenades. The Nazi gold trail extends further east to the picture postcard lakes and mountains of the Salzkammergut near Salzburg in Austria. This was also to be part of the Alpenfestung. It's another place where stories of hidden treasure proliferate. There were also treasure caches which came from the SS and, um, uh, and the Foreign Office. Um, everybody had evacuated their individual uh, treasures, as you might say, uh, down to this area. As well as gold, priceless artworks taken from private collectors, churches and museums were sent south. Hitler had intended to display art acquired by his agents in a special museum in his Austrian birth town of Linz. But as defeat loomed, the treasures were sent to salt mines for safekeeping. But not all treasures required the protective, rarefied atmosphere of a mine. The stunning lakes that are part of a UNESCO World Heritage Site have an added allure as fabled dumping grounds for Nazi gold. The Salzkammergut has been dubbed the Devil's Dustbin. Nazi relics have been recovered from the Grand Lakes like this sign that proclaims 
Nazis enjoy visiting here. It probably adorned one of the many local inns until such advertising suddenly became unfashionable in 1945. One of the many alluring stories surrounds the deep, remote lake Toplitzsee. A local farmer is said to have been summoned in the dead of night to help SS men dump truckloads of heavy boxes into the lake, packed with gold and secret Nazi files. Such alleged eyewitness accounts sparked a kind of gold rush. Divers dreamt of scooping up a fortune. But alpine lakes are dangerous. At least two divers have drowned in the Toplitze, its dark waters full of snags and hidden obstacles. But in 1987, it seemed that the deadly risks were worth it. A breathtaking treasure was apparently recovered from the treacherous mud by a local dive expert, Gerhard Sauner. We dumped it in the Toplitze and then recovered it and had it confiscated. Three days later, they realized it wasn't gold. It was a glittering example of Gerhard Sauner's mischievous sense of humor. The gold ingots were bars of bronze, but his hoax proved to be a 24-carat sensation. We were given it back, but there was a massive media reaction. Gold found in the Toplitzsee. It went round all of Europe. The fake gold features in a display in his dive shop, along with a huge range of Nazi and other relics recovered from the lake. He's found everything from medals to a working anti-aircraft gun, but no gold. And yet, another kind of treasure has been found in the Toplitze. In the 1980s, biologist Hans Fricke ventured deep into the lake, searching for a wealth of wildlife. The biologist discovered a previously unknown worm, but that's not what made headlines. The lake yielded an intriguing wartime secret, bundles of British pound notes, perfectly preserved in the oxygen-deprived mud and water at the bottom. It was the second time that British banknotes were found in the Toplitzsee. I knew that the Austrians had apparently cleared out the lake as part of the recovery of a German diver in 1963. So I was amazed that we still found these huge amounts of money down there. Perhaps that's what was in the boxes a local farmer claimed to have seen when he allegedly helped the SS dump them in the lake. The printing press had also been recovered, relics of Nazi attempts at economic sabotage. They were targeting the British economy system, the British money system. So the, the whole idea behind that forged banknotes was to cause inflation uh, in Britain. The banknotes were forged in the Sachsenhausen concentration camp. As well as counterfeit currency, Nazi victims were also forced into working on underground missile factories. Nordhausen, or Dora Mittelbau, was one of them. It wasn't in the Bavarian Alps, but in the central German Harz Mountains. When American forces liberated the camp, only a few victims remained. The rocket engineers they were enslaved to serve had fled south to the so-called Alpine Fortress. In the Alpine underworld, like this tunnel near Salzburg, the Nazis continued to work their victims to death. A memorial stone and graffiti, testament to the horrors that were once inflicted in the tunnels, usually locked up and largely forgotten. Polish, Italian, and French prisoners from the nearby Mauthausen concentration camp were among those forced into slavery.
Few survived, and fewer still lived to bear witness to the human cost of the Nazi Alpine fortress fantasy. Some returned to commemorate fellow victims of Mauthausen. Like Austrian priest, Johann Gruber, who smuggled food and money into the camp, but was found out. And French priest, Père Jacques, who was sent to the camps for trying to save Jewish boys from the Holocaust. Both were unable to save themselves, but fellow prisoner Jean Monin managed to hold on to life. I was already in the barracks for the dying. I thought it was all over for me. But friends took me into the central camp and hid me there for 14 days. Then we were liberated. I weighed 38 kilos then. Mauthausen was one of many horrors that the Western Allies and Russians would uncover as they advanced into what was left of Hitler's Reich. The regime responsible for the murder of millions was in ruins. Wary that they could face a final fanatical fight in a Nazi Alpine fortress, the Allies had cut escape routes to the south and stormed into Bavaria itself. The American 7th Army advanced into the traditional Nazi heartland and marched into Nuremberg. Once an imposing staging ground for Hitler's elaborate rallies, the medieval city was bombed to ruins, as was much of Munich. The city that bred the Nazi movement bore telling graffiti. Concentration camps Felden, Buchenwald, I'm ashamed to be German. But few had dared to speak out when Hitler was in power, and millions paid the price. Dachau was the first concentration camp established under Nazi rule. The survivors were liberated. The oppressors became the oppressed, hunted down and forced to answer for their crimes. Others, like Adolf Eichmann, who played a key role in planning the mass murders of the Holocaust, retreated into Austria. Before he died, a fellow Nazi who worked with SS deputy Ernst Kaltenbrunner recalled a lakeside stroll with Adolf Eichmann. He complained to me that Kaltenbrunner hadn't received him and had presented him with a roll of sovereigns, English gold coins, through an adjutant. Eichmann said, I don't give a damn about that. I have my own. I want orders on how to proceed. He was one of the few who really believed in the Alpine fortress. The Allies cautiously closed in around what they thought could be the dreaded Alpenfestung, or Alpine fortress. South of Austria, the German garrison in Italy surrendered. Time was running out for senior Nazis hoping to make a last stand or desperate escape. The Allies continued their advance around the mountains where fanatical German forces might fight a final battle. But for important Nazis like Adolf Eichmann, there was no Alpenfestung in which to hide. He was captured, but later escaped. Others, like Himmler's deputy, Ernst Kaltenbrunner, used the threat of an Alpine fortress as a bargaining chip. Ernst Kaltenbrunner realized, well, the war is over, and, and how can I rescue myself? But then he said, well, there is an, an, an Alpine fortress. And there is a danger of a last battle. And he knew that the Americans, the British, were keen to end the war as soon as possible. 
So he must build up the danger of a last battle and then to offer something to say, well, we can avoid that. We can avoid that. And if you're going to rescue me and if I'm safe, then I, I will do everything possible to avoid that last battle. Kaltenbrunner was one of many Nazi war criminals who thought they could negotiate and get away with murder. Karl Wolf had participated in the deportation of the Jews of Italy to Auschwitz. He had to sell something to save himself. And so what he offered was the key to unlocking the Alpine fortress. Once they got into the Alps, the Allies realized there was no fortress, no fanatics wielding wonder weapons in a last-ditch fight. The problem is, if you want to have a fortress, you must build a fortress. You must have time to build fortifications, barbed wire, trenches, uh, bunkers, shelters, whatever. It was far too late. So even if we ask the, the question, what happens if, um, there was absolutely no chance for them to have more than just, just a last battle of one or two days. For some senior Nazis, the Alpine fortress was a ruse that bought them time to escape justice. A group of SS men who should have gotten to know the hangman uh, retired and lived out their days. That was the basic effect of, of the negotiation. These SS men who offered something they couldn't give managed to uh, escape justice. Other prominent Germans were also keen to talk to the Western Allies. Rocket engineers like Werner von Braun developed the V-2 missiles that killed many thousands of innocent civilians. Yet they were given new lives in the United States to continue their work. I don't think it was a big problem for him. It certainly wasn't a big problem for me. I could see the advantages that we could continue working on rockets here under relatively good conditions, while there was pretty much nothing happening in Germany for many years. The Germans had run out of manpower, materials, and perhaps the will to mount any kind of meaningful resistance in the Alps. The Wehrmacht and the Waffen SS was beaten by April 1945. There was almost nothing left. So there was resistance west of the Rhine, but not very much east of the Rhine. There was resistance in Hungary from hardcore SS units, but not in Austria anymore. Nothing was prepared. There was no fortress. There was nothing there. It was just a peaceful lakes peaceful alpine region, um, there was a spring, nice weather. In the calm that followed the spectacular fall of Hitler's Reich, lesser known Nazis like Adolf Eichmann slipped away. But there was no escape for the larger than life figure of Luftwaffe chief Hermann Göring, who also fled south. His flamboyant tastes extended beyond elaborate uniforms. The Reichsmarschall was an avid art collector. But the art treasures of senior Nazis like Goering and Albert Speer came from dubious sources. Ironically, some Nazi art ended up hidden in Austria, where it had originated, taken from Jewish owners after the Nazi annexation in 1938. They set up an organized system of expropriation called Aryanization, by which they registered the property, the assets of Jews in Austria, and then systematically stripped them of their wealth. Now, the art collections were part of that asset stripping process, and German art dealers moved in and removed systematically uh, metaphorically speaking, at gunpoint, the art collections of Jewish art dealers and, and art collectors. Thousands of artworks destined for Hitler's Führer Museum 
were recovered from an Austrian salt mine. Himmler's deputy, Ernst Kaltenbrunner, was also extracted from his Alpine hideout. He was tried for war crimes and hanged in October 1946. According to some accounts, a large quantity of gold was found hidden in his Alpine villa. SS commando leader Otto Skorzeny was also captured. He's also said to have had a hoard of Nazi gold. He was interrogated by the American Army Counterintelligence Corps, and when he was interrogated, it seems that he forgot to mention anything about the uh, vast treasure that he'd uh, actually taken possession of. The SS Major is the subject of many intriguing tales. One says he was sent to France in search of the Holy Grail. Despite admitting that he and his men fought in American uniforms, he was spared, and some say extremely rich. Skorzeny received a treasure from, um, from Josef Spassel, a senior SS administrator. He had orders to get in touch with Skorzeny, and of course he handed over a tremendous amount of, of treasure to Skorzeny, which has disappeared. It's yet another alluring story of hidden Nazi loot that inspires treasure hunters to this day. Skorzeny and his troops were once camped near the Austrian lake of Erdensee. Evidence of their presence was found in the mud. I marked all the underground springs here for the hydrographic office. This lake is like a gigantic bog. And during this work, I found a ring. The SS Ring of Honor seemed to have been flung into the lake as the Allies approached. Perhaps it wasn't the only thing dropped into the Erdensee. Another tale has emerged of mysterious goods dumped into the water. There was a forester who told us there was an Alpine hut here and a high-ranking SS officer had come to get the key. And then they went down and took stuff out of the hut to the middle of the lake. And then they dumped it there. And we didn't find anything because there is so much mud there. It's really difficult to find anything. The Erdensee is relatively flat, carpeted in a thick layer of mud that would swallow a heavy object, like a box full of gold. It's also a nature reserve, and diving is usually strictly forbidden. Tentative permission was given for a search of the lake. From a boat loaded with state-of-the-art radar scanning equipment. And a GPS locator, which would record the precise position of any object detected in the mud. A radar map of the lake floor revealed a box-like shape in the mud. Was this Otto Skotseni's gold? Austrian forestry officials were unimpressed and forbade any diving. At least one historian is also highly skeptical. This is all a myth and, and it's all driven by this perception of, of, of Indiana Jones. This is a good story for, for a Hollywood film, definitely, but has nothing at all to do um, with history. We know that, that they sometimes try to hide the gold, but this was recovered quite quickly. But legends like that of Skorzeny's loot won't die. If a fortune in Nazi gold was dumped in the lake, perhaps it's already been recovered and spent. After the war, SS commando leader Otto Skorzeny left his native Austria for good to enjoy an apparently wealthy life. Zini was put into a prisoner of war camp. He was there for approximately three years, I believe, two or three years. And um, ultimately, uh, he just walked out of the prisoner of war camp and disappeared until he resurfaced in Spain in 1950. 
uh, at which point he seemed to be much richer than he had uh, been previously. Arthur Scorzeni was interviewed at his holiday home in Mallorca in 1973. Ruled by the fascist dictator Franco, Spain was a safe haven for unrepentant Nazis. It is every soldier's duty to lengthen the war, to hold out as long as he has the order to do so. Whether that is sensible is for posterity to decide. I don't think we have quite reached that point yet. Personally, I don't regret it. Would you do the same things again today? I can tell you that I would do the same things again in exactly the same way today. Two years later, the smoker died of lung cancer, farewelled by fellow Nazis unashamedly proffering the Hitler salute. Skorzeny took any secrets of Nazi gold to the grave. This is again part of the secret story and, and, and the, the true Nazis living in Madrid and, and being millionaires because of the Nazi gold. No, it's, it's very unlikely. It's definitely not possible that he had two tons of gold with him uh, in, in his suitcase and, and then flying to Madrid. Back around the German Alpine town of Garmisch, the hunt for fabled Nazi gold goes on. It was here in June 1945 that American troops recovered more than 700 bars of pure, refined bullion. The hoard was worth hundreds of millions of dollars. All that's left is a hole in the forest floor. Yet treasure hunters still dream of finding a mother load, similar to that unearthed by victorious Allied troops. Riches that were recovered were transferred to a special Allied commission. A lot of the treasure was found in, in the 1940s, but an awful lot of treasure just disappeared. Some of it was stolen, some of it may very well be still there. And somebody one day might just find some of it. It's a prospect that continues to tantalize treasure hunters in the hills and lakes of the Alpine region, once thought to form an Alpine fortress. But the Alpenfestung was a myth. There was no fortress and no heroic last stand in the mountains of Germany and Austria. Like the Alpine fortress, the legends of Nazi gold also seem to be no more than a myth. Yet the scouring of crags and crannies goes on. German and Austrian lakes have produced a variety of Nazi relics. Tons of wartime detritus have been recovered from the deep waters of the Toplitzsee. Bombs, mines and rockets, but no boxes of gold. You don't put a gold treasure into a deep lake because it's just impossible to recover that thing. So it's very unlikely, very, very unlikely, that in some deep Austrian lakes they're still waiting something for us. Mm -hmm.